Hi and welcome to another episode of Inspiration in Action. The goal of this podcast is to allow you to be inspired by and learn from other creatives, their process, where they get the ideas from, and their views of the world. This episode includes my interview with Rob Woodcox, an American conceptual photographer who is widely known all over the internet for his series of images of giant structures made of human bodies. Besides creating and financing his amazing artworks, Rob also works for clients like Universal and teaches conceptual photography worldwide. He has held over 75, just think about it, 75 workshops all over the world. In addition, Rob is passionate about helping those in need and organize photography-related projects to raise money for foster kids. There is a lot to learn from this guy, and this interview proves it. We discuss how curiosity for shooting dancers turned into an impactful art project, Rob's unique method of finding inspiration in music, and how overcoming your personal barriers helps to become a better artist. Enjoy! Straight away, I really want to dive into your uh, amazing series with the dancers. Please tell us how on earth you do this, how you manage to shoot those incredible works of art and... First of all, how did you come up with the with this idea? Uh, and I know that I've been following you for such a long time. I know that you started with images that were completely different from that. How did you arrive to this one? Well, I think that um, you know. So my in my earlier work, um, I've been doing photography for about ten years now. And in my earlier work, I was always kind of pushing my own personal boundaries, trying to accomplish a more surrealist style. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've always been creating like these really bizarre compositions and concepts. Um, But I think what kind of pushed me over the edge into this style that I've been working with lately is actually the political environment of my country. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. as the world unfortunately knows, we have, you know, just this horrible sort of leadership going on in the U.S. right now. And... um, you know, when living in the U.S. when that was happening and being an open-minded, artistic, you know, loving, accepting person, you know, <clears throat> we were all devastated when this happened. And you could feel it everywhere you went. It was like the entire energy of the entire country of the U.S. just shifted mm-hmm. to this, like, unfortunate position. But the good thing was everybody was coming together and fighting back and creating you know, new sources of inspiration and power and and community together. Mm -hmm. And so I remember traveling to New York City um, shortly, you know, a few months after Trump was elected. And I was just, I I was feeling so inspired by how people were coming together to push forward positive, good things and concepts in the world. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to create this scene that represented a lot of people coming together. And I was introduced to some dancers um, that do freelance in New York City. So they're, you know, a mixture of people from Cirque du Soleil Mm -hmm. to Broadway to all sorts of really talented dancers. Mm -hmm. And uh, specifically one of my friends, Mati Gelman, and his friend Nicole Ray, Um, were introduced to me and they just knew everybody in New York. So Mm -hmm. I remember being there for like 10 days and saying, hey, I want to do, you know, a dance shoot. Could you gather some dancers? And within a week, we had 12 dancers come through just for the sake of creating art. And we created an entire set on a rooftop in New York City, Mm -hmm. overlooking the Empire State Building, overlooking the World Trade Center, Um, really iconic views. Um, And so that was the first installation of my dance Mm -hmm. series. And we basically, um, we were building something to show that like diversity is beautiful. Um, coming together is beautiful. Community is beautiful. And you know, that first set Mm -hmm. gained so much attention. Uh, I, I was shocked and I had so much fun creating that, that I kind of became obsessed with making these big structures out of humans Mm -hmm. and, the more I pushed the concept, the more they got surreal and turned into a tree of humans and, you know, a staircase Mm -hmm. to heaven made Mm -hmm. out of humans, you know? So it's, it's, it's a series that has developed, um, from a need that was 
you know, in our society, you Mm -hmm. know, I felt the need as an artist to promote what I believed in, which is, you know, being together, community, um, all of those things. And yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It sounds amazing. And, um, I know that group photos, they are probably for me, at least they are one of the hardest photos to shoot. And it's so hard to work with, to work with like at least uh, three, five people, but you work with 12. And how, how how on earth can you do that and then create those amazing things? Do yeah, you find well, it challenging? It's one thing that really helps on each of the dance shoots is mm-hmm. I typically have uh, at least one person who's sort of directing. Yeah. So I I know what I want, but I'm mm-hmm. not a dancer, so yeah. I can't speak in the terms that mm-hmm. dancers speak. Yeah. So I always sort of have one friend or connection that I'm relying on to sort of direct things. So in New York, it was my friend, Nicole. Um, when I'm in Mexico city, a lot of times it's my friend Giovanni or, Mm -hmm. um, some of the other dancers and in Los Angeles, it's my friend Vinny. So it's like every, every city kind of has Mm -hmm. its like main dancer connection that I've made. And then we kind of pull together our teams and, they're the ones that are saying, okay, Rob wants this shape. So do this pose. You no, know? Like, okay. And so it, I always have help. Like I could never do it by mm-hmm. myself. Yes. Yes. And do you work with one, um, constant team, like with the same team, uh, in all of your shoots or do you change people, teams and stuff? So because my dance series is kind of constantly gaining more attention as we speak, um, yes, I work with the same teams, mm-hmm. but I continuously am getting introduced to new dancers. So usually the team is just growing. Like, mm-hmm. for example, I have, um, I keep sort of a catalog of talent for each city that I work in mm-hmm. and my catalogs of dancers for the bigger cities like LA, New York, Mexico, they're like mm-hmm. pushing 30 people. So yeah. if I really wanted to, you know, and, and I have more people contacting me every day. So if I really wanted to, I could probably get a pretty massive <laughs> dance crew together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, what about your shooting team? Oh, definitely you need some assistance. Well, uh, of course that there are people who direct the dancers, but what about like makeup artists and um, I don't know, maybe some photographer assistants as well. Do you Absolutely. have those? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For for all of my shoots and again, in all of the different cities that I work in consistently, um, I do have a crew. So Mm -hmm. I have some best friends when jobs allow, when I'm getting hired for more commercial work, Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'll fly my crew to a, to a city. So I'm working with, you know, my number ones, you know? Um, but in every city, I, I definitely have a group of people that I rely on and, Mm um, it's, it, I, I'm always open to working with new people, but I will say, you know, for anyone out there who is a photographer and, mm-hmm. and wants to build their own sort of crew of people that they rely on, um, I will say having those consistent people is much better for workflow mm-hmm. because we all know each other. Of we course. like each other. Um, we know how to get things done together. So mm-hmm. it, it's definitely something that I... I rely on and I'm very thankful for. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I can tell I, I have the same experience because then there are some people that you don't have to explain them stuff and they sort of understand you very fast and that, that just saves a lot of time and energy and emotions. And so definitely yeah. it's uh, a lot easier and better. Um, can, could you please tell us about how you, started and how you were uh, looking for the style because you mentioned that and I, of course I know that you were after some surreal works at the very beginning and you were shooting also self portraits right and then yeah. how did it all start for you you when you discovered photogra- photography was it easy just like flowing or was it challenging tell us for me so i would say the inspiration side was easier than Mm -hmm. the making it career side. So, um, in the beginning I, I picked up a camera like 
really trying to learn how to use it for the first time yeah. when I was 19. So okay. I haven't been shooting my whole life or anything like that. Um, I am 28 now, so it's, mm-hmm. it's, it feels like it's been my whole life. Now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I, up until age 19, I was always very artistic, but I didn't know how to channel it. So mm-hmm. I tried drawing, I tried painting, um, I played instruments for a while, and none of it really felt like me. Like, it didn't feel like the art form that fit for me personally. Mm-hmm. And I just, if I tried to draw you something right now, you would laugh. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't working yeah. out. Um But I had remembered when I was a kid, my mom always sent me to camp with like a disposable camera Mm -hmm. and she would always give me instructions. Like you have to take at least 50% of the photos have to be of people. Cause if she hadn't told me that Mm -hmm. I would have gone into the forest and just taken pictures of like leaves or something. Cause Mm -hmm. I always loved nature. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I don't know, I feel like that sort of challenge as a child, um, really pushed my creativity. And then when I was 19, I was, you know, searching for my art form. And I told my parents, I want to go to photo school. Like, I don't know why I just Mm -hmm. want to do it. And there, it was like, it was in me or something. Um, and so I went to a a local college that had a Canon sponsorship. So they had all the gear I could want and Mm -hmm. everything. And I went to a two year program at Washtenaw community college Mm -hmm. in Michigan, where I'm actually going to be teaching a seminar in March Um, it's kind of my first time going back. Um, and yeah, I just kind of fell in love with photography. Like I just for the love of it, I would go out, um, about four or five times a week, just shooting for personal work. And about four years into doing that, I was so in love with it. And I had started sharing on Flickr and some online communities Mm -hmm. and, I had started to build like a real life community around photography. And that's when I decided like, I need to do this full time. Mm -hmm. So I was working a part-time teaching job in Michigan Mm -hmm. um, for about five years until I was 23. And then at age 23, I decided to go full time. So for the last five years, Mm -hmm. I've been doing photography full time. Um, I've been self-employed and I've done a variety of teaching workshops um, doing commercial work, licensing my work, mm-hmm. you know, getting work featured in publications. So it's been a, it's been a large mix of, um, endeavors for sure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It sounds like a lot of fun, your, your life. Yeah. But it's very important that you answer that question as well. Like you're saying that you're now a full-time photographer because People who are watching us right now, many of them, they're just thinking, should I make the transition of being a full-time photographer? I, maybe some of them have like a part-time job or like a full-time job, but they are interested in photography. So they're very much interested. Is it possible to make a living as a photographer? I guess that you probably guess that, get that question a lot when you teach and you teach a lot of workshops. Could you please tell us about your workshops? Over 75 workshops, seriously. <laughs> wow. <laughs> In different countries of the world. That's impressive. Yeah. yeah tell us what, what, like, personally, I'm interested. What does um, the program include? What do you focus on uh, when, when you teach? Yeah. Tell us about that. Absolutely. So uh, my workshops have taken a, a few varieties of formats, but the, the most common format is a sort of two and a half day workshop. So mm-hmm. Um, typically it's like a Friday to Sunday. Um, Mm -hmm. most people are free on the weekends. So on the Friday, we'll sort of have more of a gathering. It'll Mm -hmm. be like a dinner or a meeting, just kind of introducing the weekend, introducing all of the students with each other. Okay. Uh, I find that when people already know each other, it makes them more comfortable in the learning environment. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like, you know, especially when I'm traveling, it's like, I just crossed the world to teach you a workshop. Why not? you know, have a friendly welcome dinner, you Mm -hmm. know, the first night. So typically there's um, sort of that experience on Friday night. And then Saturday and Sunday are the full day experience. So on Mm -hmm. Saturday, we typically focus on um, all of the shooting. So the morning will start with, um, the morning will start with sort of talking about social media and, um, you know, web related stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
will then move into working with lighting, working with models, um, and then we'll actually go into a live shoot session. So on the first day of the workshop, it's like I'm de I'm demonstrating how I shoot with a model, mm -hmm. and then I'm handing that opportunity over to the students mm -hmm. and giving them that one-on-one. -on -one yeah, I think it's very very important. Yeah, and may many people look forward to it. Definitely. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. That's that's always like one of the most fun parts of the process. Mm -hmm. And then on on the Sunday, so the second day, second full day of the workshop, mm -hmm. we typically move into more of like the editing process. Yeah. So um, usually we do the first day on location because a lot of my work is location based. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we'll be in like a beautiful national park, or we'll be in a beautiful manor somewhere. Um, it, it varies, obviously, location mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. country base. Um, but then the second day, it's typically, you know, getting down to the basics of editing. How do I piece together my final image? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. typically that's in a studio space. So there's always space for more shooting if students want mm -hmm. to practice again with lights or whatever. Um, but it's actually, I'm usually surprised people are equally interested in shooting and seeing me work in a Photoshop. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you also did something, uh, some learning series with Flurn, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I saw several lessons. I, I think they were great. And I think that everyone who's watching us right now should go and check that out. Maybe you are having something new coming with some, some other or yeah, do you, so maybe actually, you um, I'll, I'll go ahead and add this to my story after the interview, but, yeah. um, I actually have a master class out on Udemy right now. Okay. So I wow. spent the first half of last year kind of filming and creating that and released it last June. So, mm -hmm. um, I'll definitely put a link to that in my story after this interview. Please. And, um, I also... I'm going to be traveling and teaching some seminars this year. So mm -hmm. I actually took a break from travel workshops mm -hmm. for a couple of years because they're very exhausting. Yeah, I can um, tell. And I actually self-planned um, a whole, like, two world tours. Oh, my God. So, yeah, but in 2015 and 2017, um, I did two different world tours. Okay. Um, and between them, I traveled to over 20 countries. Wow. Um, teaching. Yeah. So, and, and all of that through, all of that was through social media. And just so you just organize it yourself. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Well, you're the first Seriously. person, you're the first photographer who, well, I'm talking to, <laughs> I've been talking to quite many during my interviews and everyone says that now we have an organizer and then they contact us and then we come and then it's not possible to organize it in some distant country. And now you say this, wow, I'm so impressed. Yeah. The, cool. power, the power of networking and community yes. um, yeah. is strong. And I mean, for me, moving forward, I, I would agree with everyone else that you've talked <laughs> to. I would rather have someone else doing the organizational part yeah, because course. it allows it allows you as the artist to focus on your craft. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of the workshops that I'm teaching in, in this year are organized by others. Mm -hmm. um, but it is possible. It's a lot of work. It's exhausting. But it is possible to plan your own workshop tour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Wow. And uh, what... Yeah, I have had so many questions. And now when you were talking about the workshop, it's so, so interesting. Uh, when, when you, yeah, tell us about your process, please, because, uh, I've read that you, uh, spent like at least half of the week scouting for locations. And you also mentioned that location scouting is very important for your work. And then I also read that you have a very interesting method of finding new ideas. You analyze mu music, uh, texts, right? Lyrics. Sure. Tell us about Absolutely. that because that's so unusual, I guess. From... <laughs> so sure. Yeah. So I'll start with, um, the process, I guess. Um, so for me, it, it really depends on the photo and actually having been doing this for 10 years now, um, I've spent a lot of the early years in my career doing a lot of location scouting and trying to find the most unique spots to mm -hmm. shoot that nobody else has ever seen. 
Um, I actually, uh, since I was 14, I've been really into backpacking and hiking into remote parts of the mm -hmm. wilderness. Mm -hmm. Um, and so because of that, I kind of have paired that with my photography, um, and given myself kind of my own niche where I, I photograph in a lot of unique spaces, people are always commenting on my location choices and being like, how did you even find this? Mm -hmm. Um, but I kind of have a knack for it because I've been doing it for so long. Uh, but that being said, uh, anytime I'm traveling to a new place, I typically book, you know, a week extra, even if I'm shooting or doing a workshop, because for me, it's important to get to know a place. I don't, I don't like the concept of, you know, a fast paced tour where you're in this city one day, in this mm -hmm, city, the next mm -hmm, day, in this mm -hmm. city, the next totally day. Um, I really like to absorb culture mm -hmm. to build community. Like I said before. Yeah. So you know, for example, if I go to Vietnam to teach a workshop, you know, for the week before I'm traveling the countryside, moving around the city, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, just checking it out and letting myself become a part of it. Yeah. And I feel like not only does it give me stronger connections and, you know, access to more interesting locations, mm -hmm. Um, it also makes me feel more educated about the space that I'm working yeah, in yeah, so I can better serve my students so I can better communicate everything. Um, and so, yeah, for any given shoot, I do a lot of scouting and then the shoot process is, you know, anywhere from one to two days of shooting, mm -hmm. depending on the size of the project. And then post-processing can be <clears throat> a whole another world <laughs> like for some images um if i'm just taking like a more simple portrait where i've done a lot of detail work or something mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on their body and it's more about the wardrobe or the flowers that i've glued to them or something that could take you know one or two days to edit um but if i'm doing a, a larger composite like my tree of life photo yeah or you know some of my my more composited dancer images um those can take you know up to a, a week for oh. me to process because, yeah. you know, I'm not sitting there for a full week, but, you know, I have to leave and come back the next day and see how my fresh eyes, you know, think of the photo. And so, yeah, it really bears her image. And then um, you asked me another question. What was the yes, second question? Um, tell us about the process from the when you get the idea to the and but to get at the final image like do you do sketches um do you plan a lot like of course the location part we got already but like how do you find models this this thing certainly mm -hmm. so from concept to completion i would say um i conceptualize ideas in a variety of ways but um my most common ways of conceptualizing are relying on personal experience or the emotional experiences of others. So um, you had mentioned that I get a lot of inspiration from music. Yes, yes. Uh, and I will, I will actually sometimes have what I call music sessions where I isolate myself from all the outside noise and I'll, you know, sit in a corner of a room where I'm comfortable and I'll just start playing an album that I really resonate with. So sometimes I'll have heard a song recently that I want to, use in this process or sometimes i'll rely on um age-old music that i just love so it's it's music that i could do this 10 times too mm -hmm. and still get new ideas wow. um so i'll do that and i'll be listening to the music and i'll i'll just let my mind wander and visualize whatever comes to my mind from hearing those music mm -hmm. or lyrics okay and while I'm doing that, I start writing. So I capture my ideas by writing them down. I keep a journal. Um, it's now for me online. So I have an app, Evernote, that I use. Mm -hmm. And I stick all of my concepts in a note on that app. Okay. Um, but what this does is it, you know, ideas are fleeting. So if you don't capture them, you might lose them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for me, I like to give myself spaces where I can create new ideas mm -hmm. and then capture them. Okay. So that's, that's how I use these inspirational sessions. And then once I have an idea, you know, it's, it's already in my mind. Most of my concepts are fully developed in my brain mm -hmm. before I ever even contact a model yeah. or 
set the location. So if I can see, you know, for example, what, what the, the tree of life image that I, I has been going around Instagram mm -hmm. a lot lately, um, it features dancers in the shape of a tree yeah. in a stand dude setting. Mm -hmm. So I had that idea probably six months before I created it, yeah. you know, yeah. like I, I imagined this tree of people in a desolate space. Mm -hmm. So once I had that visual in my head, I had to go to the drawing board and say, okay, what locations do I know that are desolate? And I started asking my friends in Mexico where I was at the time. Mm -hmm. And we came across this group of sand dunes out on the coast. So once I knew the location and I had everything that I needed to, to shoot the image, that's when I contact the models. So it's like, once I have all the logistical things in place, that's when I know that the shoot can happen and I can move forward with getting other people involved. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you know, I, I already had a whole network of dancers in the city. So I contacted all of them and said, I need as many dancers as I can get, bring your friends, <laughs> bring your van. let's fill the van with people. Okay. Um, so we literally took a, a 15 passenger van from mm -hmm. Mexico city yeah. to the coast. Had a ho we had hotel rooms for everybody. We did the shoot and it was an amazing weekend. And actually we shot three or four concepts while we were there. We made good use of the time. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it was just, you know, a week of processing time, you know, getting the images downloaded, sorting through them, piecing them together mm -hmm. and making that kind of final select. Mm -hmm. so, How do yeah. you get the funding for this whole production? It's so for this one specifically, it was out of pocket. So yeah. I believed in the concept so much that I was willing to pay mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had just received, um, a really good payment from a job basically. So for me, you know, I'm moving into a phase of my life where most of my work is getting funded through a sponsorship or, you know, I get a really good job and then it funds me to be able to do my own art for yeah. a few months. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it, it, it depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, your method of analyzing, uh, analyzing musical lyrics, is amazing. It's just something, I, I think it's very unique because most of people, they just look through photos on Instagram <laughs> to find inspiration or Pinterest, <laughs> that's Max. <clears throat> they just look at the works of other photographers and they don't search for inspiration anywhere else. And I think that it's really important to look outside and take notice of different forms of art. And for me, it's visual and it's great that it's music for you. Yeah. yeah. No, for one thing that I kind of, and I think this sets me apart with my concepts, um, but something that I, I made a decision for myself at a mm -hmm. younger age in my career was that I didn't want to ever um, copy or yeah. duplicate the work of others and I, not that that's always a problem. I think there's ways that you can mm -hmm. pay tribute to other artists okay. and make tri tribute work and things like that. But I really wanted to set myself apart. And so, um, I actually don't spend a lot of time looking through other photographers work because, you know, I think in some way it could subconsciously affect my yes. inspiration. Yeah. Um, I will say I do look up to some greats from, you know, for example, history. <laughs> for example, Tim Walker, of course. uh, Inio Roy Cuenco, uh, Richard Avedon, mm -hmm. Annie Leibovitz, of course, mm -hmm. um, Gregory Crudson, mm -hmm. uh, Ansel Adams, you know, yeah, there's yeah. Uh, the list the goes on, Yeah, but <laughs> there are a lot of greats that I was originally inspired by. Um, I remember being in photography school and thinking like, Oh, photography, it's like yearbook portraits and like boring yeah. stuff like that. And my, I remember people close to me saying, Oh, you'll never make money with photography. Of and course. then we had a class that was teaching us about the greats, basically Richard Avedon. And, um, we talked about Tim Walker and some really surrealist people. And I was like, Whoa, <laughs> like I can do that with my photography. Like that's what I want to do. 
And I remember telling people like, oh, I'm going to be the next Annie Leibovitz, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. So um, I never, I never wanted to settle for anything simple. I wanted to push my mind as far as I could. So um, I developed those concepts early. I used to, um, when I was living in Michigan, it was always freezing cold in the winter. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't do anything but sit in my house and think about ideas. So I think that, um, that sort of hibernation period back yeah, when I was, you know, a younger artist, yes, yes, yes. it actually helped me to learn how to capture my thoughts and everything. So mm -hmm. actually the winter period has something magical about it. I find that, yeah. uh, I'm most inspired during the winter time and it should be during summer because I can like shoot outdoors and stuff, but no, it's like the most creative work, the the best work I get in the winter time. Yeah. And I also talked to another artist, P Petty Mar. She's from Canada and you should check out her work. She's amazing. And she's, she also says the same, like <laughs> winter time <laughs> is the time for the best work. Uh, yeah. I've heard that you have book coming out like you're working on a book could you please tell us about that yes yeah. so actually this is my first time publicly mentioning this oh so cool for giving me this platform yeah. um but yeah so i i'm gonna be making like some bigger public announcements soon but mm -hmm. um i was contacted by a sort of niche fine art um publishing company called Thought Catalog. Okay. Um, you can check out their Instagram and their website. But yeah, uh, if you could basically stories, they yeah. partner with a select number of artists a yeah. year to publish books mm -hmm. for their audience and for, you know, to publish a book. Mm. So I feel super honored. I was selected for 2019 nice. and um, basically this company is going to be working with me over the next year to develop a coffee table style art book of my photography. Wow. So, um, it sounds like we're going to be launching, um, s some sort of pre-sale at some point in either the late spring or early summer. Mm -hmm. So definitely if you're watching and you're interested in my art and having it in your house, um, I would love for you to like, just keep watching and when the time is right, I'll be talking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it sounds like it's going to be launching at the end of this year, or early next year. Okay. So, wow. Yeah. Will you develop some new work for that one or will it include your previous work? Yes. So it's going to be a mixture of my existing work and new work. So there's okay. going to be unreleased new work in wow. the book. And mm -hmm. I actually am taking a few kind of secret trips this year to create. Wow. And I'm gonna be, um, it's going to be really hard because I'm yeah. so used to, <laughs> to you know, in the world of Instagram where yes. we're always sharing. Yeah, um, yeah. But I'm going to be doing a few kind of secret projects wow. that won't be released until the book comes out. So. That's so exciting. <laughs> that yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. So you um, recently moved to Mexico City. And so you changed countries and of course you traveled a lot, but I know that changing countries like for living is a whole different thing. And I personally did that and I have my own experience and it might be very tricky. So tell us about your experience, how it is for you. So, uh, for me, it's been a mixture of things. I mean, I, the city I was living in before was Portland, Oregon and which is a beautiful city. I, I honestly missed it a lot, um, but it didn't have the exact market that I wanted to be growing in. So it didn't have as much of the fine art of fashion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Portland has much more of sort of like an outdoor gear vibe and they have a lot of sports mm -hmm. brands and things like that. But that's not really the part of the industry that I wanted to be working in. And so I decided to moved to Mexico because I had visited there and fell in love. You know, Mexico city is renowned for its artists like Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera, uh, Leonora Carrington, these really amazing powerhouse surrealists. Yeah. And my start in photography, like I told you was yeah. all about surrealism and conceptual mm -hmm. photography. Mm -hmm. So to be in a city that sort of, globally embraces the type of art that I like the most. It mm -hmm. was like a dream come true. And 
Mexico City is actually bigger in population than New York City. So mm -hmm. um, people, I think a lot of people, especially from the U.S., um, maybe it's different over there in Europe, but a lot of people in the U.S. are very, like, uneducated about Mexico. So they're not aware of how just diverse and multicultural and developed and amazing it is. Mm -hmm. And I have loved it since the moment I set foot there. Um, so, and I would, I told you how that dance shoot came together in New yeah. York so quickly. Well, the same thing happened in Mexico. I, I told one person that I wanted to do a dance shoot uh -huh. and it was like seven days later, I had 14 dancers wow. Wow. like, um, willing to work with me and, and create some art. So, I've had a lot of great uh, support and welcoming people in mm -hmm. Mexico. So it's been, for me, it's been very simple. And the logistical side hasn't been a challenge because mm -hmm. I actually chose to just start fresh. So when I left Portland, I sold all my furniture. I gave away all my plants to my friends. Um, I gave away a lot of, a lot of art and gifts to my friends <laughs> uh, and sold a bunch of stuff. So I really kind of, cleaned the slate and said, you know, I'm just going to move to Mexico. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start fresh. Uh, but what's funny is I was renting a room uh, from a friend to try and get situated mm -hmm. in the city. Mm -hmm. And then I started booking so much travel that I've actually been living in Airbnb. <laughs> <there>. <laughs> yeah. So I've been keeping some belongings at a friend's place. Mm -hmm. And I actually have about nine to ten months of travel booked this year mm -hmm. so okay. i'm not even going to be in mexico as oh. much as i would like of course. um but it's exciting because everywhere i'm going is um gonna be a good experience yeah i've read that um like in your recent post in your recent post you tell that you have um you are overcoming some inner barriers right now like your personal barriers and like there are some struggles and could you please tell us about that because i kind of can relate to that i i've like the past two years i've been kind of reconstructing my whole uh, way of thinking <laughs> and my uh, it did a lot of uh, rewinding my brain as well so tell us about how you overcome your personal barriers Sure. Absolutely. Well, um, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's my newest <laughs> image. Um, I guess, you know, something that I've realized in the last couple of years is that we are so much more capable than we think yeah. of doing things and so taking true. on challenges. And, you know, when you're young, you, you're, you've only experienced so much, so you don't know what else is out there. You mm -hmm. don't know what you are capable of. And so new challenges can seem very overwhelming because you've just never faced them. Yeah. But for me, I've experienced that every time I overcome something new or something a little bit bigger, it expands my ability yeah. to do it again. And so for the last year, especially, I've been taking on bigger projects, bigger clients. And it's, it's just been sort of like that inner dialogue, you know, like, can I do this? Is this what I want for my life? And the resounding answer after I accomplish these things is always yes, like keep going, keep pushing. And so um, for me, you know, I've always been the type of person that wants to please everybody and, mm. and be friends with everybody. But something I've realized is that in life, there's only going to be so many people that really have your back and support you 100%. Yeah. And so this year has been that kind of discovery process for me. You know, there's been a lot of people that, you know, made promises that fell through. Um, there's been people who I thought would, you know, do certain things and then it fell through. And so you, you've kind of, I've kind of sorted through the people who I can rely on mm -hmm. who I can't. And what's exciting is that there's been these people that just never change, you know, like they always love you. They always support you. And that's something that I've discovered this year and kind of more than ever, you know, it's like now that my challenges have gotten so much bigger, you know, just, just with clients or work or, mm -hmm. you know, the things that I'm putting on myself, yeah. you know, those things have grown and become bigger. 
but I have these amazing people that are sticking through it with me. And it's, it's, it's just been like seeing, it's like a lighthouse. Like I actually have a lighthouse on my, Oh yeah. <laughs> it's the perfect uh, yes, metaphor, yes. but um, it, it's like these people have become beacons in my life and I'm very thankful for them. Um, and I've realized that if you're trying to do something big in your life, you have to have people around you. You have mm-hmm. to be supported. Um, it's really hard to do it on your own. And I think, you know, we've seen that we've seen these like celebrities that commit suicide because they're isolated, like, or they, they kind of go, mm-hmm. you know, they kind of lose touch with reality. But if you have people in your life that are grounding you, that are, um, you know, supporting you and you're open to that, which mm-hmm. is the most important part. Yeah. Um, I think that's how you can continue to take on the world essentially, you know, yes. and do bigger and better things. Yeah, but I also think that um, even if you don't have those people, you need to, first of all, support yourself because yeah. that's probably the hardest part because sometimes yeah. you just stop, oh no, I cannot True. do it. <laughs> so, like, no, this is such a big project. I will screw it up and something like that. So first of all, yeah. maybe you should support yourself because, well, I, it's good that you're lucky with those people, but it's sure. true. Not, not all of us are. <laughs> Sometimes, like, I feel uh, when I talk to people, I kind of feel that I'm the weirdest person in the room always because I shoot weird stuff and then people that like, don't get it. Like, why do you do yeah. this? Why don't you shoot weddings? People shoot weddings usually. Why don't you? So, yeah, but... I just need to. I think to... we should be better friends because <laughs> I'm always one of the weirdest people in the room. <laughs> yeah, and you gotta find other weird people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. That's why I'm actually partially why I'm doing these interviews because it helps me connect with other total, complete weirdos <laughs> elsewhere in the world because they're not enough in my <laughs> surroundings. So yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um, could you please tell me uh, what in, in like which are your biggest dreams as an artist? Like you already have so achieved so much, but there is always more, of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's another thing that's important. Um, I actually have a few a few close um, friends that we talk about this kind of stuff all the time. Like what is next? What is our goal? And for me, um, I've kind of always had goals, but it wasn't until recently that I figured out how to sort of organize that so that mm-hmm. I could feel like I was in control of what am I doing? And the, the reality is we're never fully in control. Mm-hmm. Life is going to do what it wants. It's going to surprise us. Um, but it, it can help if you sort of organize your thoughts and at least have goals and achievable things in your future. So for me, I always like to have a mixture of um, more like near future goals and long-term goals. Mm-hmm. So for me, I, I have a whole list of, you know, publications that I want to be published in mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and artists that I want to collaborate with. And I even have like a list of dream celebrities that I want to photograph. Can you please name some? Uh, for me, a few would be probably FK Twigs, um, Willow Smith, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Rihanna. She, she's, yeah, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I also, um, Willow I is beautiful. Wanna, there's, there's, there's a, the, the list goes on for sure. Um, mm-hmm. those are all like some of my favorite female singers. I, I, I tend to listen to a lot of female singers. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically, but, uh, yeah, I think, I think having those sort of like short-term goals, like mm-hmm. I'm going to be in this magazine next yeah. and like targeting that is really good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Things like that are really important. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also have my long-term goals. Like I want to start, um, a creative camp for, you know, underprivileged kids yeah. and have it be funded by people who can afford it. Yeah. Um, so I, I have like these long-term goals of things that I, I might not be able to do tomorrow, but maybe in the next 10 of or course. 20 years, yeah. I can start working on. 
I think that's that's the way to do it. You have your short term goals which are like easily more uh, easier achievable and then the kind of like something very big to look forward to and tell us more about your uh, philanthropic activity how you managed to fundraise that money for the foster kids and yeah tell us how uh, because it's it's so unusual actually not so many artists do that yeah so um Well, so quick summarized version of me, I am actually adopted. So from a young age, uh, I actually felt like I was kind of rescued from a really mm -hmm. negative situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so I've always had this outlook on life, like I'm lucky to be here, you know? Yeah. And so um, when I was... Uh, a teenager, my mom started working with foster kids through an organization that did camps every summer just for foster kids. So mm -hmm. they would do a summer camp for foster kids, and then throughout the year they would um, continue mentoring programs monthly. So it was a really beautiful thing because um, the foster care program is really uh, corrupt in the U.S., So there's a lot of families that will adopt kids just for the money, and they're actually continuing the chain of abuse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and there's also a lot of kids that just end up in what we call group homes. So they don't even have their own family. Mm -hmm, they're mm -hmm. just living in these kind of hotel-like yeah. sterile environments with a bunch of other kids. And um, they don't really get a lot of that direct, tender love that they need as mm -hmm. kids. Um, and so those were the kids that we worked with every mm -hmm. summer for mm -hmm. a few years at this summer camp. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just became something that I was so passionate about mm -hmm. and that I needed to, I felt like I needed to do something about. Yeah. Um, and so for me at the time, uh, my audience was a lot smaller, but I, I kind of had a big standing in my community back home. And so I decided to bring together some friends and create a whole visual series to portray what I, what I saw foster kids going through. And so a lot of volunteers from my community um, came together mm -hmm. to let their kids model for the series and everything. Um, we weren't able to photograph actual foster kids because technically they don't have guardians that can mm -hmm. sign over the rights for their photos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they have... Um, abusive parents that are looking for them or something like that. So they're, they're low profile mm -hmm. um, and everything. But we had some kids that were adopted, participate. We had some kids that had experiences in the foster system but were now out of it, participate. And essentially, me being adopted and having worked with these kids, we told their stories through these models. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically, the, the story ended up going around ABC, Yahoo, UK Mail, a bunch of big publications. And we did an Indiegogo fundraiser. And the initial fundraiser raised $12,000, which was about half of the amount needed mm -hmm. to fully fund the next year of camp. So uh, between the donations that they already had and our project, an entire year of camp was funded. And I think that year, that enabled like 50 kids to go to camp. Mm -hmm. uh, And so in the years to follow, the project had raised a lot of awareness. And I think it, I think in total, it probably contributed $30,000 to $40,000 to the camp wow. um, in addition to the initial 12K. Wow. So um, it was quite an experience. I mean, um, just to know that your art can directly affect people. Yeah is a really beautiful thing. Definitely. Um, and, you know, we all live in societies that are run by money, unfortunately, um, but we can harness that mm -hmm. for good, you know? Yeah. Um, and for me, moving forward, a lot of my current work still touches on um, important aspects of society, yeah. furthering queer identities, furthering um, the acceptance of our bodies, mm -hmm. furthering, you know, diversity between different ethnicities, mm -hmm. cultural backgrounds, everything like that. So, um, you know, I, I'm not currently doing like a fundraiser for anything, but mm -hmm. my work is always about creating change, yeah. creating competition, um, 
Yeah. Is this the main topic of inter interconnectivity series? Also. Yeah. 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 Could you tell more yeah. about it a bit? So I have a whole series of work that involves um, both body paint and string yeah. on the human body. How do so, you stick it? <laughs> <laughs> so for the string photos, um, you might have seen there's images where there's literally like patterns of lines on the face mm -hmm. and then strings coming off. So um, I've worked with a, a variety of makeup artists and also I've done some of them myself. Yeah. Um, where we actually glue the string to their face using latex glue. Okay. And it's a special type of latex skin glue, um, similar to like eyelash glue. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's safe for the skin okay. um, and it comes off relatively easily without pain unless maybe it's attached to your hair. <laughs> um, yeah. But all the models have been amazing. Like, um, it, it, it's a series that requires a lot of patience from the models because the body paintings can take anywhere from an hour to three hours. Um, and the gluing of the string can take the same. It can be anywhere from one to three hours of oh gluing. Yeah. So the models have to be extremely patient. And then work um, <laughs> yeah, in front then, of the camera. When you have it, yeah, when you have it all over your face too, it, it gets itchy and of you know, so yeah. I literally praise my models. I'm yeah. like, thank you, like I do everything for them. <laughs> yes. um, but uh, I would literally do anything for them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so basically um, that series came about, um, that was actually, so the original photo was part of the paint set and it was inspired by the, this is a little bit dark, but it was inspired by the Pulse shooting in Orlando. Mm -hmm. So um, I was just really heartbroken over that whole occurrence and my community being like directly targeted in our society. And then yeah. that kind of continued over the next year as in Chechnya over near Russia, yes. you had the internment camps for gay people. So they were starting to arrest and murder gay people just for being gay. Yeah. Um, and that was really affecting me negatively. So um, I decided to turn it into art. And um, I kind of had this idea, like, we all bleed the same color, but then kind of transforming that into the rainbow colors of the gay community. Mm, so yeah. um, I did my first body painting line set of two guys with rainbow mm -hmm. stripes up and down their bodies. Mm -hmm. And that gained such a good response and it was published in Out Magazine and all this other stuff. Um, okay. So I continued creating that series because I saw the power it had to literally talk about the lines that connect us, like we're all connected. And, you know, when people are being shot over here, it's affecting the whole world because um, we're all, you know, that could have been any one of us, you know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. gay, straight, doesn't matter, queer, trans, you know, we're, there's people being targeted. So I wanted to continue that series um, and talk about a lot of different subjects. I've talked about race issues. I've talked about gender, body, all of that stuff. And after a while, I had realized I had never really talked about the individual. And so my first string image, I wanted to sort of still tie in the idea of being connected to others with mm -hmm. the string leaving the body mm -hmm. to an unknown place. Um, but featuring that power of self, kind of like you talked before, you can't really, until you love yourself, you can't fully love others and connect to others. And so that's kind of where that series started with the string coming mm -hmm. off of the face and the body. Um, it was all about how we are powerful at, as individuals and then we can connect to others. And that series eventually turned into multiple models as well. Um, yeah. Being covered in string. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an amazing series and it's really inspirational. And seriously, uh, it's so very much different from your early work that I was following and I, I think many people were following and it's really great to see how you your style has evolved over time that you were doing something like a little bit surreal maybe focused at, on on yourself and some, something else but then you evolved to 
the art, the whole art evolved to talking about these global problems, and that's great because I don't think that many artists get to that level. Actually, many of them just stuck um, get stuck at the personal level, just um, um, doing art about their own emotions, just there, and that's it. But that's the next level of an artist, of a real artist, and you're there. So. I'm so amazed by it. That's really fascinating. Thank you. And I, I, I definitely respect um, something that I think is so beautiful about art is that it can be it can be so unique to each artist. Yeah. And you know the personal journey, like you said, is important because mm -hmm. we have to we have to deal with that and face that. Um, and and I, I have seen a lot of artists doing featuring more of a personal journey, mm -hmm. but it's see how that can connect. Yeah, to yeah, some yeah, yeah. People exactly. Who think yes. They're alone or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. So I, I see the beauty in all of it. And, um, but for me personally, like I, I feel like I've gotten to a place emotionally where I feel stable with myself mm -hmm, and I, mm -hmm. I want to extend that to others and say, look, like we can all be better <laughs> fulfilled mm -hmm. in some way if we work together yeah. and that's where where this group stuff has come from cool we have ronnie garcia here joining in um do you know ronnie he is from chile ah yes, uh, yes. i love ronnie yeah. we're supposed to be soon oh cool yeah i just did the live with ronnie and he's just amazing he was so great that the conversation i really hope i meet you two guys like in yes. person that was just so, so fun yes well i'm coming to europe this summer so really where yeah. oh, which country um, at least so for sure i'm going to turkey and mm -hmm. probably france spain and italy cool. um But I might try to spend a couple of days in London, Amsterdam, and Berlin as well. And I'm open. Like, it's a little bit of a flexible schedule. Cool. Please let me know the dates. <laughs> Because yeah, I'll, I'm I'll, also I'll, traveling I'll, I'll around. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Because I'm going to Amsterdam soon. And then I am probably will be in Paris. And I'm open to Berlin as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, well, cool. let, let's meet. <laughs> Yeah. Um, my final question to you would be about um, what, what, in your opinion, makes a great photograph? Ooh, mm. hit me with the hard one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because it's um, a very hard one. Many people are struggling <laughs> with it, but yeah. Well, for me personally, I guess it's all kind of objective based on everyone's personal opinions, but... For me, what makes a good photograph is one that um, makes me feel something. So mm -hmm. for me, like if it's technically amazing or if it's um, if it's emotionally amazing or if it's just compositionally amazing and it makes me feel mm -hmm. something, that's mm -hmm. what makes a good photograph. Um, It's like you're I, stealing that, the words from my mouth. <laughs> It's just that yeah, I, I wouldn't reply yeah. exactly the same. That, that's just the, my my reply. Yeah. Yeah, and that and that's the fun part about being an artist is that it can that inspiration can come in so many forms. Like I might see a completely white scene with like a red dot, and it reminds me that my heart is still beating or something. You know, like yeah. it just, yes, yes, it yes, can yes. come in so many forms. Like. Um, You know, even just appreciating, like, some images might not emotionally drive me that much, but mm -hmm. I can appreciate yeah. the immense amount of technical skill that somebody put in mm -hmm. to creating that image. And then other images, for me, I tend to gravitate more towards the ones that stir me emotionally, but yeah. um, it can just depend on the situation. Yeah. So. This wraps the episode up. Thanks so much for listening. All the names and resources that we mentioned can be found in the show notes of this episode. Just go to dashapierce-art.com slash podcast. If you like this podcast, please go to your podcast app and hit like. It helps more people benefit from the content I'm putting out there. Now, until next time, bye!